Welcome to the Health and Social Care Committee um, for us to hear predominantly about the, your state of care report and also uh, as an accountability session for a number of issues that have been raised with us as a committee that we'd like to put to you. Um, for those who are following from outside the room, could I ask you both, starting with yourself, Mr Wyman, to introduce yourselves? So I'm Peter Wyman, I'm CQC. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our new Chief Executive, uh, Ian Trenholm. Good afternoon, I'm Ian Trenholm, the Chief Executive of the Care Quality Commission. Well, welcome to thank both you. of you, and thank you for your excellent report. Um, I wonder if, in starting, you could tell us what are the key messages from the State of Care report, firstly for the public, but also um, and those in frontline service roles and for, for government? Sure. Ian, do you want to start? Thank you. I Thank you, Chair. I think there are, there are two uh, key messages. Um, the first one is that um, people are generally getting good care. Uh, when people consume care, if you will, at, at a particular location, if they go to see their GP or a hospital or, 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 or go, and, uh, go and have home care, um, they, they get generally good care. And what we've seen over a number of years is, a, is, a, is an upward trajectory in terms of the quality of care people receive at a location. I think what we identified this year, though, is that, is that people's ability to access that care is, 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 is becoming more and more difficult. So what happens is people are waiting longer to see their GPs. They're finding uh, it much more difficult to, to get the, the, the care in their own home they need, which means they're more likely to end up in hospital and they're more likely to end up staying there once they are there and less likely to be able to leave. So what we found was the system uh, isn't necessarily working in the way that it could do. So that, that was the sort of that was the um, that was the first message. The second message really is that there's there's a, a need for a long-term funding solution for social care. I, I think I think uh, we've seen in, in recent days uh, welcome uh, funding going into social care. But I think what we identified in state of care was the need for a long-term and sustainable solution to to, to how, how social care is funded in this country. And I think if I may just to build on what Ian said, uh, the, for providers of services and commissioners of services, it is this system point. I think that's something we've, we've uh, been aware of for a while, but uh, as you may know, we were asked last year to look at uh, 20 areas to, to see how the system uh, works. And uh, it, it usually doesn't work very well. So even if you've got individual parts that are good, uh, the, where they join up and where the citizen has to navigate their way through multiple different services, um, it's, it's really quite problematic. Mm -hmm. So I think our big uh, sort of ask of the systems locally is to work better together to um, reduce the difficult edges that people have to navigate their way through. We look mainly at, uh, we, uh, our review was for people uh, uh, who, who were um, elderly, but actually exactly the same point works for anybody with multiple long-term conditions. They're frequent users of services, uh, they use lots of different services, uh, and they struggle. Thank you. And we're going to come back later on to look in more detail at your system reviews, um, but I, I'm going to start the questioning with Rosie. Thank you. Um, to the chair, uh, we've had a number of, um, in, b before your last chief executive's um, appointment, um, we had a number of quite serious um, debates in this committee about the CQC and its performance. Um, I think it's safe to say that after Dame Jo Williams' disastrous performance here, it wasn't that long before she left, because she could not adequately describe how CQC was making a difference in the lives of um, those people whose health it was supposedly monitoring and indeed um, she expressed a view that you couldn't possibly go into people's homes because um, that, that, that would be confidential therefore those people at most at risk were not being looked at. So given that y your, your chief executives um, sat next to you I still would like to pose a question to you um, in that the new chief executive's health and care experience is more limited, a lot more limited than that of um, David Bean. Um, what steps has the board taken to manage the loss of experience and potential credibility at a time when you're losing um, Angela Sutcliffe, you're losing Steve Field, those people who have actually been the backbone of the improvement in your reputation? 
So I think my starting point would be uh, to say, actually, I think Ian has a bit more experience than, than, than uh, uh, you, you, you may have realised. And uh, interestingly, uh, was the chief executive of a local authority, so he understands some of the local authority uh, issues very well, uh, as well as previously having been chairman, uh, as chief executive, rather, of uh, NHS uh, Blood and Transplant. So he's not without experience. But I think the, the, the more fundamental point uh, I, I'd make is that we have strength in depth. I think one of the things that uh, David Bean and the three uh, chief inspectors have done over the last few years is build a, a really strong uh, team or teams. Um, and actually, you could take any one of us out, and, and, and the organisation would carry on extremely well. The, the, the so, other, is there any point in you being there then? Uh, well, it's a good question. <laughs> um, I think my. <laughs> but, I mean, don't be serious. <laughs> no, well, to be if you're not making a difference, no, get off no, the bus. Uh, so, 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 I see my job uh, 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 as being to make sure that strength is maintained. The other thing I was going to say is that we've built a strong board of non executives, and that's something I've personally been quite involved in so that we've got a ra vast range of experience now uh, of, of the skills that you need on a board and I think we do two things as a board um, the non-executive element of the board uh, one is we hold the executive to account so we make sure that, that, that they are doing everything you want them to be doing and then secondly it is about making sure that um, uh, their additional knowledge and experience can be used productively within CQC. So, um, uh, a, 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 if you go back to when David was first appointed, he and David Pryor, the then chair, were very clear that CQC was not fit for purpose. I think, we, and I've sat here with David in the, in, in the, in the past, we've said to you, this is now a, a, a good organisation. Uh, we don't think it's perfect by any means, so there's a way to go to improve. Um, but it's 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 not in a bad place. Um, but uh, uh, strength in depth, big teams of really good people is very important. Could you tell me what the level of churn is of your board? Um, of the board, um, we normally work on the basis of uh, two, three-year terms. Um, and uh, I, um, when I came to CQC, there was a bit of a bunching, so we, we sort of um, uh, staggered uh, the, the time so they're not bunched. So probably we have one or two uh, people retiring each year and being replaced by one or two others. So you just described it as bunching. So how many have left in the last the year? How many are due to go next year? So, so you've described your strength as in... The, the, the strength in the non-execs, the board itself, and depth in the organisation. So I'm asking you, do you know what the level of churn is? How many people are going that last, last, how many people went last year? How many people are going next year? So last year, one person uh, of the non-executives, one person left, um, comes to the end of their, their, their term. Um, and uh, next year, uh, two people come to the end of their term. And that feels about right. So to the me. truth so was, David went. So there's two. So it is the board as a whole. Two went last year, and if th uh, is it three? So we've got forty. So there's fourteen people on the board. Yeah. Just to put it in. So context. is it three or four? If two are going next year, how many execs? Two or three? So, um, so far as I know, um, there are only two that are. Uh, so that's at that least four. So that's six out of fourteen. So we're approaching. No, 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 half no, 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 no. Hang on. So, so. so um, uh, over the past um, 12 months, one non-executive has gone. And one executive. Uh, and one executive, that's two. And good then, grief, we can count. Yeah, uh, good. Uh, I'm an accountant, I can count. Um, uh, lovely. And then, and then uh, next, so, ne next, next, next year, um, we will have... Uh, two execs. Two, two, two execs and... Two non-execs, you just said, which yeah. adds up to six. Yeah. Six but out of 14 but, yeah, but that's over a two, the, that's over a two-year period. Oh, yeah. Oh, but you'd expect, so in, you'd expect in, that's, that, that, that's about right? So, well, you, you might think that. So in a two-year period, the half the strength and depth you've described has gone, and quite strong strength and depth, but that's fine. Um, I thank so, you very much so, for that so, answer. So, 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 just, can, just, can, because that's at the board, but my point when you were saying that Steve and, and Andrea are, are going in David's got is that there are teams beneath the board one, you know, one level and levels below of highly talented people 
Uh, so that's the strength in depth. It's not just at the board. That's I understand. I've chatted to many of them who want to see how you two are going to get on when they decide how whether they've still got absolute confidence in the CQC as well. So forgive me for that. So Ian, if I might um, address yourself, what are you taking? What steps are you taking um, in regard to strengthening your depth of experience in this field? In relation to the board. And and in, you know the CQC the. the new challenges you face because your your previous experience is, is not really in this kind of regulation. Mm -hmm. um, it, it isn't. Um, my, my role as Chief Executive uh, at the CQC is to build on the legacy that David, uh, Sir David Behan created uh, along with Peter and others um, to take the organisation onto its next, onto the next stage if you will, to make our, us as an organisation an easier organisation to do business with an organisation which is a more attractive place to work um, and, and also to make uh, the organisation more, uh, more public facing in terms of we have an awful lot of information that, that we gather and we, use, we process and we use for our own judgments but actually what I'd like to do is make that information more widely available to the public so the public can know what we know if, if you will. Um, and and that, that means doing a number of things. Uh, as you know, uh, Andrew Sutcliffe and Steve Field uh, are, are leaving for, for, for two, in my view, very positive reasons, and they will go on to make some very positive contributions to uh, the, the health, health and social care fields in, in, their, in their respective futures. I'll be replacing both, both of those, those people, uh, and, and the reputation that the CQC has, I hope, will attract a very strong field. Um, I'm also uh, building the executive team by adding a chief digital officer and I'll be shortly going out to the market to do that. And the reason for doing that is because I want to enable uh, CQC to be seen uh, as, a, as a genuinely easy place to deal with that has a good suite of, of digital services uh, and an easy organisation to, to, to work with. So, so I'm looking to strengthen my, my very senior team. Um, but just to, to reiterate Peter's point, um, that there is a strength in depth to the, the, the managerial team uh, at the various layers, which, which I think does ensure that on a day-to-day -day basis uh, we, we do a good job. It's worth noting that 80% of our employees have been employees for longer than two years, and as of the 31st of March we had a vacancy rate which was just over 3.5%, which feels like, uh, like, like, like a good story in terms of where the CQC has perhaps been in previous years where there was, there was high turnover and high vacancy rates. We don't have those anymore. Could you, uh, final question of her nature, um, could you just describe what you mean when you say that the public should know what we know? As a regulator, shouldn't they know what you know now? Well, they, they do. What I mean by that specifically is that, is, that, is that we collect together a lot of public domain information and we, we process that, we bring it together, we gain insights from it. Um, and then we, we, we deliver those insights in the form of, of reports uh, on individual settings or on thematic so, so do you see your future as a data repository? Because I need a good regulator out there making sure that people get good care and that you are ensuring that those people who operate poorly are taken out of it. Um, so describing being a data repository doesn't really give me... Um, a, a, a great feeling that you're going to spend more time just collating stuff as opposed to actually doing stuff. It, it's an issue of presentation, I think. Um, we're not going to spend our time as a data repository, but what we do have to do is we do collect an awful lot of data mm -hmm. and information as part of our day job. Um, and we, we use that internally, and what I'm saying is that it would be great to be able to make those data streams more available than they currently are so, so that the public can access them. It's, it's a question of just making them more, more easily accessible rather than getting into a completely new line of work. I'm, I'm definitely not saying that. Uh, and to give you reassurance, we are also not saying we are going to stop doing the things that, that we have been doing. So we are going to continue to regulate in the way that you have just said that you want us to do. Well, uh, you, you'll forgive me, but m history, look at um, LCH, you missed it all. You're absolutely missing from the field when that was going badly wrong. It was down to me getting whistleblowers to see the CQC. Mm -hmm. When it comes to Liverpool Prison, you gave, it a good report, you gave it a good report, then a bad report, then a good report. So forgive me for not sitting here being absolutely enamoured with your ability to handle the data. We actually need to see you deliver more. 
Thank you. Can I just um, expand on the issue of data? Because you'll be aware of the King's Fund report, uh, which showed that the quality indicators used in the CQC's intelligent monitoring data sets had little or no correlation with the subsequent ratings. And I think most worrying that 172 practices that received an inadequate rating weren't predicted at all. Um, how can you reassure us on two fronts? Firstly, that you're going to use, uh, what sort of kind of data are you going to use to make sure that you're prioritising practices that could be in that risk group, um, but also about how it's going to, to make a difference subsequently and how you're going to improve your data collection and what you're going to collect. So I think um, the starting point is to reassure you and the committee that we are not stopping um, our normal cycle of, of, uh, of inspections mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, right across the various sectors there will be um, uh, inspections on a, on a time basis. Um, the intervals of time can in part be informed by our previous experience. So we now know a huge amount more than we did a few years ago about every provider. Uh, but also, um, I want to use the, the intelligence that we can receive from multiple sources, including whistleblowers and, and, and many others, uh, to, to say, actually, this, this particular provider appears to be um, uh, getting into some difficulty, and we need to go and, uh, and look, either bring forward a scheduled in inspection or do an inspection that we hadn't planned to do at Can all. Can I ask, would that yeah. be on the basis of a single report from a member of the public, or would you need to see that coming from multiple I sources? I think it hugely depends on, 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 on what the report is. And, and, uh, I mean, normally it won't just be one, one, one report, but something really alarming uh, mm -hmm. from a credible source. And, and, and it may not necessarily then immediately uh, uh, start an inspection. It may start a conversation with the provider, you know, do... Uh, can you give us the background on this particular issue? Um, uh, we may or may not be convinced by, by what we're, we're told. So I think it's a, it's, it's a more nuanced approach, um, but I think it would be wrong, if you put it the other way around, it would be wrong for us just to say, right, every, every two, three years we will routinely go back, regardless of any information that we've had in the, in, in, in the meantime. So I think this is, is sharpening our focus, um, but it's not replacing the... the, the uh, the, the routine nature of uh, going back. Right, so in other words, the way you're going to be effective isn't just through inspections, it will be through conversations with, uh, with people that you would inspect or bodies that well, you would I, inspect. Well, I, I, I think, and it's a point actually the King's Fund make, um, uh, if, if, you, if you have a relationship with the, with the provider, you are better able to understand what's, what's going on. Uh, and that's something we want to build on. It doesn't, it doesn't replace an inspection. Uh, inspections will be as they are today. They are inspections and our ratings will follow an inspection. They don't follow a conversation. Uh, but quite often, you know, you're, you're, we are made aware of, of, of something that appears to be going wrong in a, in a, in a hospital, for example. Um, talking to the medical director or talking to the chief executive, understanding the issue, may or may not be a sufficient uh, response to enable us to say, fine, you've dealt with that, thank you. Uh, if it isn't, then we will probably need to go and you know, escalate our own um, process and possibly have an inspection. Right. Uh, but it, it, it's understanding what's, what's, what's going on. Yes. Can, I, can I just add, add to that, just perhaps add some numbers to that. During the last, last year, we received about 8,000 uh, concerns in, in the way that you, you've just described, Chair. Um, and about a, a hundred, on about 180 cases, where they directly triggered a, an inspection. So they were obviously of some seriousness, and it was obvious that we need to, we need to immediately go and trigger. Uh, we, we, need, we need to trigger an inspection. Uh, just under 500 occasions, we brought forward a, a previously um, a previously planned inspection, uh, and in just under just just under 2,000 occasions, uh, we referred the concern to another agency that may perhaps more appropriately deal with the matter. So people like the general. That up. Once you've referred it on to another agency, would you then have a conversation with them to see whether they were satisfied? In some cases, we would, but not in all cases. Thank you. Just in, I, I just. I fear for, for the, some of the words I've just heard, because if I were to describe your, if you have a relationship with the trust, let me just say, in the case of um, Liverpool um, Community Trust, those people you'd have been having a conversation with, the chief nurses now before the NMC, 
the medical director is before the GMC, and the board didn't even turn up to be interviewed by, Kirk, by Kirk, Bill Kirkup. So tell me, how would you spot that one? Well, I would hope... Um, hope isn't a strategy. We need something a bit better than this. So the strategy, as I said, is we continue to inspect, we continue to use intelligence, we listen to whistleblowers, we will listen to you in future. Um, And so uh, you build a picture, but you do do learn a lot from from talking to people. But you missed it all. So that was in the past, and I think we're getting better. It is, but what you're describing doesn't give me any comfort that I know that you will A, inspect properly, and B, that just talking to those organs... Because this, so, this was, trust was going to be, uh, um, you know, rapidly become an FT until I exposed all this, till the whistleblowers... I mean, I didn't know. The whistleblowers came to me. I gave them to you. But they'd been to you. They'd been to the NMC. How, did, how was your inspection? How was your intelligence? How was your listening going to actually not miss something like this? So I... I, I repeat, I think our inspection process has hugely improved over the last last few years, um, and we will continue to, to inspect, and in, in, in hospitals we will be doing a, an inspection every year, so there is, a, there is something taking place all the time. That is an inspection, and it's an inspection process I have confidence in. This is then building on top of that, so that... If but you, this is a, not a hospital, this is a community trust, so that doesn't count. Um, so... Uh, all, everything that we, 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 we um, uh, are, that are registered with us, we will be inspecting on a periodic basis. So um, we're not replacing inspections with, with something different. We're adding to the inspection process. That's that's the point I'm trying to make. Uh, and, and so next time you so next time you come to us with uh, some intelligence, you would not expect us to ignore it. We will take you very seriously, and we will take very seriously anything that, it, that whistleblowers or any other information that we, we, we get. The question then is, what, what, what do we do with it? Uh, and as I said, depending on, on, on what the information is, depends on uh, the response. And the response could be that we need to understand whether the problem's been, 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 been sorted out to our satisfaction, or whether actually we don't have that satisfaction, and we, we go back and we will do a further inspection. The other point I, I would make is we are increasingly looking at leadership. And um, I, I strongly believe, and I know my colleagues do, that uh, the quality of leadership in any of these organisations is, 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 is fundamentally important. And that's something that we have been developing uh, over the last, uh, last few years. It's not just clinical leadership, it's the broader leadership. Uh, that's also necessary. So I would like to think, and I can't guarantee this to you, but I would like to think if, if, if uh, um, Liverpool happened all over again now, we would respond rather better than we did um, before because we've got better processes um, and we've, we've, we've learned a lot. Do you want to add to that? Um, I think just very briefly, Joe, I, I think we, we have to sort of s- recognise that, that we, we have relationships with a range of different people. Uh, some of which are doctors and nurses in individual individual care settings, some of which are voluntary organisations, patient groups. You know, this, is a, this is a very complex picture. And, and I think if we're going to talk about quality in the round, we have to recognise that we alone are not going to fix this. Um, but we've certainly improved the way in which we, we, we take feedback and process it and act upon it. Luciano wants to follow up on this point. Yes, so it would make sense to bring in that, that section now. Because um, some of the evidence that we've received, um, in the context of you just sharing with us that you, you are listening, um, we've heard that um, we've received concerns raised by a group of experts by experience that over the course of the past year in particular, you've drastically reduced the use that you make of the views of service users and carers. You just told us you listen, but that doesn't, very chi- that doesn't chime with what we've had in our evidence. So I, I think it's the, the, the exact opposite. I think we are getting more and more information from a variety of people uh, that are service users, um, and they are really important. And as Ian said, they, 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 they have um, uh, uh, caused us to, to act um, in ways that we wouldn't have done without that information. Experts by experience are really, really important. Um, but they're not the only, the only source of information from the public. Um, and um, I think they are particularly useful in 
uh, those services where if you haven't got whatever the condition is or uh, whatever is causing you to use that service, it's quite hard to, to get your mind around. So we, we all use general practice. You know, we all go to a CRGP. Um, we understand what happens when you're in CRGP. Um, most of us don't have learning difficulties. So um, somebody, you know, an expert by experience that, 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 that's got a condition that most of us don't have is particularly important to us. So um, we, are, we are refocusing how we use experts by experience, and some of our experts are a bit unhappy that, that we don't see their particular expertise as being where we need their help, but there are plenty of other cases where we will be using more experts by experience. But as I said, they are only one source of information to us. So, yes, do you want to go on? Yeah. And that's just related particularly to experts by experience. No, it's about listening to services. <coughs> yes. Okay. Well, if I can draw like a one particular experience, um, you'll be aware of the inquiry into the Southern Health Trust that took place um, uh, in December 2015. Uh, and in response, NHS Improvement uh, made a number of recommendations, in particular to work much closely with yourselves. And I wondered, in the wake of that, if you can um, share with this committee um, what exactly um, uh, uh, you have been doing as a CQC. Um, working with NHS Improvement um, to ensure that what happened at Southern Health Trust will never happen again? I think it comes back very largely to what I was already saying uh, 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 previously. I think it's about an improved inspection process. It's about um, uh, listening to, to, to all the intelligence that, 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 that we're given. Um, and it's about uh, being willing to use all the powers that, 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 that we have. Sure, but if uh, I can just bring you back to the question about specific NHS improvement, so can you so, outline? So, I mean, we work really closely with NHS improvement right. um, uh, all the just, time. Can you explain what that means? Can you just give us a bit of detail? Um, of well, uh, it, 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 again, it can mean different things in, in, in different contexts. So, um, at, at a high level, um, we... Um, want to make sure we have a, a shared view of what quality looks like. That's in our, uh, it's in our strategy. We want to make sure that we have really close, I'm sorry to use the word again, relationships with the key people across the organisation so that they can uh, uh, communicate often at short notice, often at you know, weekends or whatever if there's, a, if, if there's an issue. Uh, and then I think it means taking joint action where it's appropriate to take, to take joint action. So, I mean, it's a, it's a close working relationship with NHS improvement uh, and one that I think over time is getting closer. Can, can you, again, just give us an example of what that joint action, an example of that joint action in the past six months that you've taken? Yeah. If I can give two, two examples, Shrewsbury and the, the, the uh, hospital in Shrewsbury and the hospital in Dudley, where we identified concerns on the back of inspections. Um, we know that, uh, that, that colleagues from NHS Improvement were working alongside those hospitals, so we worked jointly with, the, with, with them to, to, to help the hospital with an improvement plan. But we have to draw, a, a, we have to sort of, in, in one sense, have a relationship and be, be supportive, but at the same time ensure that we are independent. So we're not, we're, we, are, we ourselves are not driving improvement. It's NHS improvement which is driving the improvement. But they're two very topical examples, I think, of where we've worked alongside NHS improvement for the, for the benefit of, of local people. Those, uh, you, you just acknowledged, arose out of inspections, but I wonder if you could give us any examples in the last 12 months of services or trusts that you've closed down or uh, whose management you've cleared out as a result of information that originated from whistleblowers and or staff? Um, I'm sure, I'm sure, uh, given notice, I can think of some, but... Uh, I'm sure, I think, probably, Chair, if we could write to you with that information... It would be really helpful, I think, yeah. if you could just give us a summary list, because I think, you know, there's a, there's a perception out there, because of the way you've changed, the way you operate, that... Um, you know, and you, you know that may, that perception may be wrong, but there's a perception out there that you know it's more difficult now for the action to be taken as a result of this. So, if you could provide us with just a few examples of where this has happened, I think that would be really helpful. Sure, but I'm happy to do that. Can, can, can I just um, come back? Cause, uh, uh, we haven't really changed in the in, in the way that it's been portrayed. No, no, but so, that's, that's, so, that's so, exactly so, why I think it's been really yes. useful. If you, if yeah, you yeah, can't yeah, happy, think yeah. of any now, if you could write be, to us with some be, examples. Be, be very happy to do Thanks. that. Now, yeah. Briefly, we'll, and then we must move on. Yeah. Just very quickly, you, you've described Dudley. Um, there's a, a real difficulty. Um, you, you, you want to work with, that, with NHSI to get improvement, 
and yet you took, got to, why can't you just be your regulator? Um, because frankly, Dudley's in a mess and it's still in a mess. Um, and can you so, tell me what, so, so, how, so, you've, how so, you've actually helped? Because so, what I've got a problem with is regu the regulatory regime. NHSE and NHSI are going to be working more closely together than might as well be one. And then you're saying that you're working with them, but you've got to remember that you're a regulator. I need you to be a regulator. So, so I agree with you totally. And I think the point Ian was trying to make was that um, our job is to, to, to uh, find out what, what needs to change. NHSI's job, amongst others, is to then help bring about that change. And there is a difference. Um, so, uh, part I don't of think you're articulating that difference in your role very well because the way it, it, it feels to me is unless you're a lot more clear about what you're doing, then you're just going to roll into this um, NHSEI so, so, mess. No, 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 no. no. So, if, 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 you, if you look at any of, our, uh, any of our reports, any of our inspection reports, they will have uh, some quite clear recommendations. Of no, no, I get that. Yeah. But you, and then, you, no, no, I, I genuinely okay. get that. Okay, sorry. The point I'm trying to make is you were asked a question and you used Dudley to describe it and you talked about working with NHSI and having to remember that you had a regulatory role. So I'm almost asking you, okay, so what did you do that can, you could show is a, a real improvement? What did you spot? You've got an, um, a finance director there who was required to move from Liverpool. He's passed your foot fit proper person's test. Uh, not our foot and proper person's not test, proper with great person. respect, um, but anyway. But that, Dudley is, going, is a special case, and the fact that you can think that you've contributed to that getting better, I, I'm astounded, because I, I think it's, it's not in a good place at all. I, I'm not, I, that wasn't what I said. Where I was asked a specific question around where we have worked with NHSI, and I'm, I'm explaining where we have worked with NHSI. What we have done is we've carried out inspections. We, um, we will be looking at, at the degree to which enforcement action is appropriate or not in that location. Um, and at the same time, NHSI will be looking at what we have found and they will be working with the hospital specifically uh, to, to create an improvement plan and working alongside the hospital managers right. to create and an improvement plan. Uh, I, I will yeah, stop, but I, I really need you to decide what enforcement needs to take place in, you know, we, you, you we, can't be doing that across the piece. That's We're exactly not. what We're I'm not. saying. I'm saying we are very clear about mm -hmm. where we, t we need to take enforcement action. Yes. So I, I think, I, I don't think that's a, a challenge. I think we, we, there are clear times when we, when we can take enforcement action and we have done that. There are times when, particularly in social care, where we have closed down locations where we have felt they've been unsafe. But we have to make this judgment that says, is somewhere genuinely unsafe as opposed to some variant of requires improvement. And, and, and that's, a, that's a difficult judgment to make in a large, busy hospital accident and emergency department. But we are really clear about, about what we think needs to happen and where necessary we take enforcement action. Thank you. Derek. Thank you, um, Ian, you've set out really clearly there what kind of action you can take and what action does happen. Um, and actually, it's also true, I'm a Cornish MP, it's also true that you can pitch up and give a rating to a care home which immediately the impact immediately is that they they're not they're not commissioned straight then by the local authority. So actually the work that your inspectors do has a huge impact on careers, can make or break careers, has can have a massive impact on morale. Um, obviously does help to set direction of how things go forward. Are you completely confident that your inspectors have all the skills and are appropriately prepared and and uh, have the, the knowledge and experience to, to involve themselves in that kind of level of, in, I won't say interference, intervention, no, uh, particularly at board level. So have, as your inspectors go in, and they ob obviously the board is running the hospital or the whatever establishment might be, have your inspectors got an understanding of what that role entails in order to have an impact on how things go forward? Okay. I think there's a number of, a number of things. I think we take our, our role incredibly seriously. Um, and individual inspectors do not alone make a judgment on a rating. So an individual inspector uh, will, will in, in certainly larger institutions, be working as part of a team. That team will form the judgment. That team will then, will then write a, a draft report. That will go through a, an internal quality assurance process where other more experienced colleagues will review that process. 
and then the, the provider themselves will have an opportunity to comment and, and comment on factual accuracy and so forth. So, so it, it is not about whether one individual inspector is, is, um, is experienced or, or not. It is about a number of people working together to, to create that, that, that rating. Um, we are very much alive to the fact that in certain parts of the country, if we rate a, a care home in particular uh, as requires improvement, it, it is less likely that a local authority will commission services from them, and the impact on that locally can be quite significant, particularly in, in areas in, in your part of the world. Um, and, and we, on the one hand, we have to balance taking that into account with the idea of, of patient safety, and, and, and frankly, we can't compromise on safety. If we think there's something that needs to be called out, then we have to do that. Uh, but we do do that by taking our role incredibly seriously. And we've certainly done a lot of work uh, over the last year that I'm aware of around consistency to make sure that our, our, our ratings between, between similar institutions with similar, similar performance are, are, are appropriately uh, managed. Uh, so that was my next question, so thank okay. you for that. Um, certainly I've experienced in my constituents where homes actually had some, there were some queries in your judgment about their record keeping mm -hmm. and not necessarily about the care of um, patients or the people who lived there and as a result they weren't commissioned that really does threaten for a small care home that threatens their existence um, in terms of I mean you're new to the role so you've had time to kind of take a helicopter view mm -hmm. what are your real concerns about the organization the CQC and how where are you going to prioritize your attention I'm going to prioritise my attention really on how we go about doing what we do. I think, I think it's fair to say I think the CQC's reputation is, is, is a broadly positive one at the moment. We've come a long way in a relatively short period of time. I think what I want to do is to look at how we go about doing our business. So are we an easy organisation for providers to work with? Are we, an e are we producing reports? Are we producing information that the public can rely on and, and is, is clear to the public? Um, and are we a great place to work um, and making sure that I can attract and retain the best, the best possible people uh, and that the work that we do is, is consistent and, and, and of a high quality. So a lot of my, my work is going to be quite internally focused for now. Uh, thank you. And then finally, Chair, um, if you have an NHS um, hospital or something not performing well, you move in and increase your inspections, but we don't see the progress. How do you then manage and review that and... and, and identify what, how you change and go forward? I think it would depend on, on the exact circumstances but in, in broad terms uh, what, we would what we would do is identify specific areas for improvement as part of an action plan we would bring in NHS improvements and, and, and make sure they were engaging with the, with the hospital or the health institution or whatever it, whatever it was um, and then we would, we would revisit and re-inspect. If we're not seeing uh, a level of improvement, we would consider whether enforcement action is appropriate and, and again, depending on the circumstances, we would, we would take an enforcement action. Uh, and then we may then go on to place restrictions on, on what that, what that, uh, what that organisation could do um, uh, and then ultimately it could lead to closure. But, it, but it, it's a sort of staged process really and I think that, that applies across both in, in primary medical services um, hospitals and, and of course in uh, adult social care. No, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Martin. No, thank you. I mean, I represent uh, an area in north and northeast Lincolnshire, and we have seen a number of uh, care homes, uh, both closed and rated uh, poorly over the last couple of years. That, those numbers seem to have uh, increased. Is that because uh, the, your, take, you, your criteria are much more sort of robust now than they used to be? Are you taking a harder line? No, no. I, th I think I think we're taking uh, uh, a, a, or trying anyway to take exactly the same the same approach. Um, we may we may be getting better at identifying uh, issues, I, uh, but um, I, I suspect what's actually happening is there's a deterioration in quality in in in. in uh, the, the homes you're talking about rather than we've moved the goalposts. And coming back to you, have just been talking about consistency. Um, certainly constituents have come to me expressing views because of the, the number of these reports and in effect they are questioning uh, the, your level of consistency between different establishments mm -hmm. and I take the point that it's not an individual view it comes back and is, is uh, reassessed and so on but uh, it, it, 
is it, you know, are you genuinely, can you give me a reassurance that you do have a fairly consistent approach? Because certainly at local level, that doesn't appear to have been the case. So I, I, I can give you um, uh, uh, the general assurance you're looking for, uh, but I think we've got to be honest and, and recognise that with a large number of uh, inspectors, um, there will be a, a small um, and, and hopefully uh, in unimportant areas level of inconsistency, which we're trying to drive out, so I'm not going to try to be complacent about it. But equally, I don't want to sit here and say, I am absolutely confident in every single case we are completely uh, consistent. Uh, what I would say is that when it comes to the ratings, um, as Ian was saying, there are processes that are in place that I think uh, uh, give me a lot more assurance around the, the level of consistency. But I mean, I know, and I know that, that you know, occasionally <coughs> an inspector will be unhappy with something where another inspector doesn't have a problem with it, and that slips through the net. So I, I and that, that of course does then lead people when they discover that to say, you're not being consistent. So I think we are consistent on the the big judgments, uh, we're not always consistent on the very small issues, and um, we need to do everything we can to, to be as consistent as we can across everything. Can I perhaps just build on, on that last point? I, I was out with an inspection team on Friday, and one of the things that struck me was that, was that what we do is not just about the numbers. Uh, so when people talk about consistency, they tend to think in, term, in numerical terms between place A and place B. But actually, we set a great deal of store by the interviews and the conversations that we have with, 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 with patients, with people being cared for, with, with employees in the particular organisation. Uh, we, we try and put some kind of sense of calibration around that so that we try not to take, take on board you know, disgruntled employees equally. We try, not, we try and recognise when people are, are trying to talk up at a particular institution. So, so interpreting that can sometimes be a matter of judgment, and, and I think there's definitely an element of judgment in our, in our, um, in our ratings, and, and that's, that's probably right and proper, given that we're trying to bring together that voice of the employee, that voice of the patient, yeah, a lot in, into the ratings process. Otherwise, we could frankly sit in an office and look at numbers, and, and we want to do more than that. And, and finally, Chair, just to sort of clar clarify your role um, in the, in the, the follow-up, clearly if you... Uh, uh, close two or three care homes in, in any local authority area. That can have a major impact on, on, on the local uh, service. And I take it you work with NHSI and so on. Uh, but you know, is there adequate uh, follow through? Because I say, I've had a number of care homes closed and that has drastically reduced the spaces available. So how, how much are you involved in follow through? So I think uh, uh, Andrea Sutcliffe will, will, will confirm this when you talk to her later, but uh, we, we only close a home as a, as, as a last resort. I mean, we, are, we are very conscious of the, the impact it has in the locality if there's a shortage already and it's a, a, another home gone. So we only close a home uh, where we believe that uh, it's not safe for residents to continue to stay in that home. What we try and do is set out what needs to be done by that home to improve so it doesn't need to close. A lot of the closures that are blamed on the CQC are not because we have actually closed the home, I mean some are, but, but very often it's because the, the, the homeowner is not prepared to put in place the, the improvements that would be necessary to make it safe for, for, for residents in the future. But, you know, I, I, it's... It, it, we take no pleasure in reducing the, the, the availability of social care. I mean, that's not what we're here to do. Um, but sometimes there is no alternative. Thank you. Um, it's very reassuring to hear that you're going to be using people more in your intelligence-driven approach. But undoubtedly, you are going to continue to be um, also dependent on uh, IT systems. And that's been identified in your corporate risk as a sort of red risk area. Um, perhaps this is a question for yourself, uh, Mr. Trenholm, about um, how you're going to address that. OK. Um, we have... Uh a number of systems at the moment which um, are, are functional uh, but don't necessarily give us the, the, the flexibility that, that we, would, we would like for the future. Uh, we have a programme of, uh, of system renewal, so uh, we've just replaced uh, large parts of our, of our desktop uh, equipment and, and we're in the process of replacing phones and that sort of stuff. So we're starting from, from that point. Uh, but we're also, we've also got uh, an, an, a programme of work which is 
replacing some of our systems that, that providers will interact with. So, in a, so moving towards a position where we can um, providers can register with us on, uh, digitally and they can, they can give us updates to their registration and so forth. Um, and in the background, we have got uh, a team, an intelligence team, who are using the systems we, we already have uh, to, to create new intelligence products, they call them, but data sets in effect um, that, that we use uh, on, on, in a range of different ways. So there's a range of different things as part of a, as part of a program of, of work. Um, and ultimately, this will be a set of fairly flexible uh, IT platforms that, that exist in the cloud. Uh, which will enable us to scale what we do, it will enable us to take data sources from other people really easily um, and enable us to, to move into a position where we can process that data and try and, try and extract insights from it. Uh, Thank you for that. Um, can I just move on to some of the future challenges and, and just look at your integrated health and social care system reviews, which, which I think is a very welcome development. Um, but do you think legislation is going to be required to allow you to move to a model where you can carry out that, those, that, those system level reviews? Okay. So at the moment, um, uh, those system level reviews have to be commissioned by the Secretary of State yes. um, and uh, uh, funded by the Secretary of State. Um, and uh, you, we could make a perfectly good case for saying that's, that's fine and then uh, we would just carry on um, without any legislative change. Um, it would be nice to have a, an ongoing rolling program, um, but you know, that's the, the Secretary of State. Um, in, a, in an ideal world, uh, you might have a, a legislation where, where we could do those ourselves without being commissioned by the Secretary but of State. Would, would that but require a legislative yes. change? Yes, it does. Yes. yes, it does. So I think there's a perfectly good, uh, if I use the, the words ill-advisedly, uh, workaround, which is the Secretary of State carries on commissioning us, so it's mm -hmm. not that we can't do it without legislation, but it would be uh, easier uh, to plan it in the way that we would like to plan it on an ongoing basis with greater certainty of what we would be doing. So we plan it in if we had the uh, ability to do this ourselves rather than waiting for the Secretary of State. Um, the, the reason I ask is that you may be aware that this committee produced some recommendations from one of our previous reports that asked for the NHS and, uh, and the voluntary sector to come forward with proposals for legislative change to allow better integrated working. And, and clearly the CQC would need to be part of that. Are you going to be working directly with NHS England and others to actually contribute to that, uh, those legislative proposals? Yes, uh, definitely. So I think that um, uh, we absolutely recognise that, um, uh, first of all, looking at how commissioning as well as how uh, provision in an area is working is, is very important, and that's what these reviews have been doing. And then secondly, as I said, looking at how the different parts of the, of the pro provider system uh, work together is very important. So we certainly want to be doing more of that. Um, we can either do it with legislation um, or we can carry on on the, the basis we are. So that, that bit. There is then separately uh, a lot of very interesting, as you, 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 you and the committee know, uh, uh, developments happening in integrated care with um, uh, uh, Different, different parts of the system um, trying to, to, to join up in very different ways. Um, and uh, we need to be um, absolutely with that as it, as it develops. So um, if, if primary and secondary care are working closely together, in, in either in new legal forms or just working closely together, then we need to, to be sure that our um, regulation and inspection of both the primary care providers and the secondary care providers is, is, is as joined up as it can be uh, so that we understand what's going on and that, that poses some challenges. They're not, they're not, they're not um, theoretical challenges, they're just challenges of scheduling and, and, and everything else. So we, 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 we currently inspect secondary care providers more frequently than we inspect uh, uh, primary care providers and I think that's entirely right but if you actually want to do the two together it's, it, it poses a, a, a logistical problem, we need to get our brains around how that works but I don't think these things are insuperable and I think as the system is developing and it's now beginning to develop quite fast we will adapt to make sure we, we are not a barrier to that, that development and at the same time um, are able to give the, uh, the, 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 the independent reassurance that's needed that 
that what is changing is working well. Exactly, but it, it's what we heard, a very clear message um, from those that we heard from, was that the steer for legislation should come from the service itself rather than top-down from the Department of Health. So it would be really useful to have your detailed thoughts on how the legislation should be tweaked. Going so, so there are the, yes. So, I'm so, not so, expecting you to comment on that in detail now, but you. I just wanted your assurance that you will be yes, uh, part yes, of that yes. uh, so, moving forward. De no, definitely. Thank yes. you very much. Um, and then uh, there's a, a specific area that's been raised with us as a concern, a very deep concern, and that is uh, the issue of online prescribing, um, how patients can be protected from websites that are dispensing prescription-only medicines, uh, which the CQC, we understand, is currently unable to regulate there overseas. And we'd really like to hear your thoughts on this very worrying situation, which is clearly putting people at risk. So I think if, if we can um, separate um, uh, what I would call traditional um, uh, uh, consulting and prescribing practices that would happen if you went into your, your GP surgery but are now being delivered uh, online um, uh, from uh, uh, the overseas online prescribing. So two different situations. So we are very supportive of uh, all the convenience both to um, uh, the medical practice and to the patients of being able to access um, uh, online and uh, we think this is a good thing. Um, uh, many GP practices do this as an adjunct to, to, to what they, they do actually in the consulting room and that's, that's, that's terrific and we can inspect that in the, exactly the way we've always done it. There are um, a number of mainly private sector uh, specialist uh, online uh, uh, um, uh, primary care providers and prescribers and they are um, if effectively operating in the same way. They're under our jurisdiction. We've inspected them. We had a number of problems with many of them. Um, you know, those have largely been corrected, although there are still some where we have, have some concerns. But we have, the, we have the toolkit, if you like, to be able to deal with them because everything that's, that they're doing uh, is registered with us and it's, it's uh, here in, the, in, in England. So that's, that's, that's straightforward. Um, the only bit that isn't quite straightforward in that scenario is where they are, they are using a pharmacists to do the prescribing and that's out with our, um, our remit, but we work closely with the General Pharmaceutical Council to, to deal with that. The thing that worries me much more than that, because I think that's all manageable, although there's some, there's some work to do, is that uh, you can go online, you can very quickly find something that looks like a, 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 a British uh, a medical practice mm -hmm. uh, with possibly GMC registered doctors uh, that to the ordinary person looks perfectly uh, reputable um, but it's operating outside uh, this country and outside not just our legal jurisdiction but actually outside our practical jurisdiction and that's a real challenge. I mean, if somebody's, so it may look like you know, something's very English, but if it's in, in, in some faraway part of the world, uh, you can't regulate it. Mm -hmm. um, there is um, something we need to look at, the system needs to look at it. The, the, the end part of that is the prescribing, uh, 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 sorry, not the prescribing of the drugs, the, the dispensing of the drugs. Uh, and if that happens in, in, in this country, then I think there are some. some uh, um, opportunities to put some regulation in place at that point. Um, but in practice, these are overseas online prescribers are just putting stuff in the post and it gets through. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, candidly, uh, anybody on the committee within five minutes could get any lethal combination of drugs they want and they will be delivered next day at mm -hmm. home. All you need is a credit card. Uh, and that is hugely concerning, and it's out with any, any uh, capability of regulation to deal with it. So I think there is a, an education process um, to, to, to put the public on notice that if something isn't CQC registered or similar in the old <coughs> nations, um, then, then they should uh, be very, very cautious. So it's about public information I, I, as far I, I as you're concerned? In my mind, I can't see any other practical way of dealing with it because you can never regulate um, what happens on the internet in another country. Thank you. And then finally from me, the issue of private screening clinics. 
um, that can sometimes generate a, a great deal of anxiety for individuals and also cost for the NHS. Is that an area that you're going to take an increasing interest in? Um, we have to 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 um, look at uh, what's within our within our within our remit. Um, but yes, if it's within our remit, we we we, we are interested. I'm certainly well aware of the the, the, the the general concern that exists. Yes, thank you, Sue. I, which aspects of that are you able to actually regulate and take an interest in? Um, I'm going to defer, uh, and, and perhaps you might like to ask that question of my, my colleagues panel. afterwards, and they'll give okay. you an absolutely precise uh, definition of what we can and can't do, rather than risk misleading you by giving you nope, an off-the-cuff inaccurate preferable. answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do, do colleagues have any further questions for our first panel? Well, thank you very much for coming this afternoon. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. to our second panel and, um, and welcome back uh, Professor Steve Field and Andrea Sutcliffe and, and welcome for the first time to uh, Professor Ted Baker. Um, I wonder for those following from outside this room whether you could introduce yourself starting with yourself Andrea Sutcliffe. Thank you very much. I'm Andrea Sutcliffe. I'm the Chief Inspector of Adult Social Care at the Care Quality Commission. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ted Baker. I'm Chief Inspector of Hospitals at the Care Quality Commission. Thanks, I'm. I can't get my words out. He's so excited. I'm Steve Field. I'm a, a, a GP uh, and I'm Chief Inspector of General Practice. So, my remit, for those who don't know, is general medical practice, dental practice, uh, urgent care, online uh, consulting, um, and uh, health and justice, which is about prisons and safeguarding of which we've spoken before, but also most recently about the local system reviews, just so that you're clear about the remit. That's very helpful. Well, perhaps that might be a good place to start then, uh, because you'll have heard the questions that I posed to the previous panels. Um, and I guess my opening question to you, um, Professor Field, was how well supported are your inspectors by the information they receive and the IT systems that are supporting them? Specifically on the local system reviews? Well, I think just to, just to, uh, as an opening question about okay. that. Okay, so most recently, in the last few years, we've had some very, very good information and we've been able to synthesise that, put it together, into some very good um, data packs. So working backwards in time, the best data packs we've produced in uh, CQC have been for the local system reviews over the past 18 months, which is the sum of information... Uh, on each practice, each care home, each hospital in a local area. So, for example, when we went to Stoke-on-Trent, we had very detailed information on the providers. But in, an, in addition to that, we produced uh, data which the local uh, leaders found very helpful, they said, on uh, delayed transfers of care, uh, information about flow through the system. So whilst in the past we've provided information about providers, we now can follow people through the system. And that was specifically about people aged over 65. Mm -hmm. uh, and I personally found it extremely helpful, and the feedback was that also. So that was helpful, and you felt sufficiently well supported by the systems? Now, yes. Now, right. Um, and, I mean, given that, that you're shortly moving on from your role... Um, will you have time before you leave to feed in your detailed thoughts on legislative changes that would support those, uh, those detailed system reviews? Um, absolutely. Uh, uh, and as you heard from our chairman earlier on, um, under the um, Health and Social Care Act 2008, we 
uh, are not able to look at commissioning of services, but we can look at provision. And personally, I think we should be able to review areas, not just for people aged over 65, but for example in the health and justice system in prisons, the quality of care provided is the sum of how you commission and contract as well as the provision. If you're not putting enough money in or if you've got a contract which doesn't work, the providers haven't got a chance. And so um, what we've uh, learned from the local system reviews is um, if you uh, ha are aged over 65 and you happen to be in, let's say, Northampton, the quality of care you receive is not just from the GP or the hospital, uh, but it's how you pass in the handoffs between mm -hmm. them and particularly in social care. And we've learned some uh, really big lessons about, uh, for example, um, uh, domiciliary care if, it is, if the contract's changing or underfunded. That can cause problems right the way through the hospital and back into primary care. So uh, my recommendation very strongly would be that we should be able to continue as CQC looking at local systems and local areas. It doesn't mean you need a duty, but the ability to do that, I think, is very useful. To do it yourselves without being directed by the Secretary of State? Correct. Thank you. And, and can you perhaps tell us a, a little bit more about your other key learning points from those local system reviews? Well, um, thank you. Uh, I, I'd be delighted. We, we did publish a report uh, called Beyond the Barriers, mm -hmm. but there are also 20 reports on local areas which are well worth a read because uh, even though we brought everything together, you can learn lessons uh, specifically from those individual reports. But um, uh, as you are probably aware, we were commissioned to look at um, 19 of the worst areas in the country for delayed transfers of care and an, another group of, of metrics. And we were asked to go to Bradford to look at a, a good area. So we, our report is slanted towards what's not good. But, but what we found was there was good practice in each system, even if it was a, a potentially bad system. We found a lot of really dedicated staff working both in health and social care often not paid a great deal. I personally have found it very difficult seeing in social care how some of the poorest paid people in society have some of the most important jobs for looking after vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. um, we found that uh, people's experiences, mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to judge outcomes in this review, but experiences, and uh, we did find cases where people were in hospital and then had to go into care when they could have stayed at home if the care had been better. But care was good when the leaders had a vision, they worked together on that vision, and the people all the way down uh, the workforce tree to those caring for them on the ground in social care and hospitals understood what was going on. Um, and um, we found a number of barriers, including funding streams, which caused problems. But in areas, just to cite Bradford uh, as an example of good practice, where they were looking at the patient's needs on the ground where they lived and they then looked up at the locality and the neighbourhood and services worked for the patient across health and social care with the voluntary sector, things went well. Mm -hmm. One final point, if I may, um, which is a bit of a hobby horse but I think it's really important. What I don't understand in health and social care in this country is why when there is perfectly good evidence leaders don't use that evidence to improve the care of patients. Mm -hmm. So an example of that, which I've been banging on about since I first came here as chairman of the Royal College of GPs, is that if you commission GPs to go into care and nursing homes, the outcomes are better. Um, there's great academic evidence from the vanguards and from North East London, but time and time again we find that people know this and don't commission it for all sorts of reasons. Mm -hmm. And that is just one powerful example, I think, uh, of how without any extra money in the system, if we commission more intelligently, we could improve the care and life of people. Mm -hmm. And what, how do you think the CQC can actually play a role in actually driving that good practice? Well, I think we're seeing evidence or, or already in a, in, a, in a small extent in that we're going, when we do go into these 20 areas, we've got three more on the go at the moment. By the time we've finished our 14 weeks, people are taking notice and there is change. Mm -hmm. But what we haven't been is commissioned to review more than three of those areas. 
So if I was looking at um, changes in how CQC worked once uh, I've gone, it would be to go back and review those areas to look for progress and for improvement. Uh, and, I mean, we've had that discussion in this room before about prisons and how you can do that. But you've got to measure the impact. Uh, and uh, we haven't been able to do that so far. Thank you. Um, I'm quite keen to move now to Rosie. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, um, this question, please, to uh, Professor Baker. Um, what are your main concerns about the sectors you regulate in terms of the sector's own performance and the CQC's ability to regulate it? Uh, well, can I come back to what Professor Phil was just saying about local system reviews? Because it's important that we don't look at that in isolation from what we're all doing here. And we sit, we sit, we, we sit as representing hospitals, social care, primary medical services, but actually health and social care is a continuum. It works together. And a lot of the pressures I am seeing in hospitals, and hospitals are facing a lot of pressures at the moment. Uh, last winter was difficult. The summer has been difficult. We're coming into another winter, and we're worried about the ability of the of hospitals to cope with the pressures. And those are front door pressures, patients attending A&E, acute medicine, uh, patients on the acute pathway. Now, that is all being driven by the fact that systems are not working well together. Uh, Professor Field just gave an example of how if services are commissioned in the community, that reduces patients going unnecessarily to a hospital. And we know that hospitals take a lot of patients that don't need to be admitted, and a lot of patients in hospitals stay much longer than they need to. And that is creating pressures and capacities on the system. So to come back to what, what you're asking about the CQC's role in this, first of all, the CQC's, CQC's role is to tell the truth about what's going on there. And our reports, I hope, give a very clear indication of our concern and the concerns of patients and frontline staff about the pressures they're working under. Uh, I should say that, that I visit a lot of A&Es and uh, I see staff who are working under very heavily pressurised conditions and are doing a magnificent job of maintaining a service. And the majority of A&Es we go to come out well in our inspections, but we do have concerns about some of them. What we have done, working with uh, the uh, healthcare professionals from uh, uh, emergency departments across the country, is to, is, to, is to draw up some guidance for them about how they can preserve safety in the A&E going over the winter. So as a regulator, we're getting to the space of helping people share their concerns and share good practice to ensure safety of patients in A&E. And I'm sure that will have an impact going into the winter. But fundamentally, unless we do the system reform that we've been talking about, the this, this situation won't change. And undoubtedly, there'll be more patients attending A&E this winter than last winter. And if we don't do anything next year, there'll be more patients attending A&E the winter after. And I think what the CQC needs to do is to shout from the rooftops about the importance of systems being sorted out, systems working well together to, to deliver integrated collaborative care for patients. I, I, I do absolutely agree. I suppose I've been involved in healthcare since about 1973, and to some extent, we're still singing the same tune. Um, I, I, I know, I, bed blockers is a dreadful phrase, um, but you know, people trapped in hospitals. Uh, we were talking about that in the 70s. We're still talking about it now. Um, you know, commissioning affects uh, the quality of care. Well, you know, you don't need to be Einstein to work that out. And yet, we still do it. We still don't commission. Um, you identify, uh, you know, a, a, a correlation between leadership and um, safety, quality. So. When do we really stop talking about it and actually make it happen? So what, what are you doing right now that's driving that as opposed to we all know about it and we're talking about well, it? But well, well I, I, I do feel that we've had a big influence on the sector in this regard. I mean, one, I've talked about local system reviews, but we've also talked about leadership and culture. We've published this whole series of reports and they are having a real impact. And interesting, if you go out and talk to, to hospitals and other NHS trusts now, they're telling a very different story from what they did, say, two or three years ago. And two or three years ago, the, the leadership would talk was all about getting a grip, uh, staying on top of the targets. Now mm. it's about values. It is, a, it is about culture. It is about staff engagement. It is about... It, 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 
driving co this constant quality improvement at the front line of healthcare. And I've been in healthcare since 1973 as well, so, so we share that <laughs> share in common. And the one thing I've learned all the way through working in healthcare is that quality comes from the front line and it comes from front line leadership. And I think one of the things that some of the trusts that have gotten problems of, have lost account of is they think they can just drive quality down from the top. You drive, you drive quality <coughs> in healthcare by enabling frontline staff to, 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 to drive uh, uh, improvements every day of their working lives and focus on these for patients. And I think the good trusts are learning that. And we have seen some trusts that have turned around their quality really dramatically. They're still working under pressure, and they'll still say that things will be difficult in winter, but they are, they've turned around their, their, their quality dramatically. But there are others, and there are still a minority that have not done so. But overall, our ratings are gradually improving. The one area where they're not improving is A and E. Uh, I was going to say I, I, I've read the reports that show you know uh, it, it, good has improved in acute sectors from 55 to 60, yeah. but that's not that's it's, not the same as quality at all. Uh, well, it, 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 and quality it, is variable. Uh, quality is variable. It's variable within hospitals, within within services, within hospitals, between hospitals. Absolutely, and that, one of the st striking things that's come out of our inspections is that variation, and we we highlight that geographically in in state of care, where we talk about the fact that there is an injustice in that some people have less good access to quali good quality care in their area than others, and that's just pure chance depending on the quality of local services, but also how well the systems in their local areas work together. But how does the system described by your chief exec and chair, how, how does that work, you know, the intelligence, the listening? Because obviously my view of the CQC is tempered in that LCH mm -hmm. um, tunnel um, where you missed everything mm. and if you'd used those very parameters you'd still be missing it because actually the whole system ignored it and I don't just mean the regulators I mean Liverpool all those people around that greater area everybody ignored uh, it and the NHS is littered with stories where systems have just ignored problems and just not done something about them and, and there's a whole history of those so, so that's entirely right and you know, I'm determined the CQC isn't part of that culture moving forward. We've got to be there to, 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 to shine a light on, on the areas where there are concerns and make sure something is done about them. And that's very much what our role is. Our inspections have moved on a lot over the last few years. I chaired the very first of the new hospital inspections way back in 2013. Uh, I'm now in charge of running the inspections across hospitals in 2018. They've moved on a long way. We have learnt a lot. And we have learnt it with the people that we're regulating. We've learnt from them and we've managed to, if you like, help them move forward as well. Thank you. Can I just go on to um, the independent hospitals and healthcare providers and ask you your view of the performance? Uh, well, we, we've now inspected all independent acute hospitals, and there's 222, 221 of those. Uh, and 65% uh, come out as good in our rating, 26% as requires improvement, 8% as outstanding. And I think if you look at the whole picture across acute independent hospitals, the picture is varied, just as we've described in the NHS, but having said that, it is broadly similar to the quality uh, uh, levels we found in the NHS. And I think there's always a, people always want to say one is better than the other in terms of quality. But the, Actually, the, we've the got no of evidence of that. The isn't the same at all. So the level of complexity of what uh, goes on in uh, there? No, they serve a different population. Uh, they don't usually provide acute care, they provide elective care, but those that provide it often provide it very well. So, I mean, we have to judge them on the basis of, this, of what they provide. Most, very few uh, independent hospitals provide A&Es or acute medical services, for instance. They won't look, at, they won't look after patients with complex needs. They want to admit patients with straightforward conditions, often elective surgery. But they often do that very well. I mean, that's not to say there aren't unique issues in independent health care that we've told them they need to address that are set different from what we found in some NHS trusts. OK, just finally, just two, two things um, about that. Um, what uh, protocols or pathways do we have about transferring uh, patients in, in grave need into the NHS? Do we, you know, is there a, an agreed protocol? It, does it just happen because well, we have a crisis? Off you go. Well, one of the things that, that, that we found in our inspections of independent hospitals is not every one of those independent hospitals had a, a, an agreed protocol, a, a safe, 
uh, thought out process for, for managing a patient who deteriorates unexpectedly and transferring them to uh, critical care facilities, typically in local NHS hospital. Many did, but some didn't, and some of them we had to take enforcement action and told them to, to, to do that. And, and, and where we found that, we've taken action about it. But it, that is one of the key areas that they need to get right. So are you assured that they've all got it right now? We, we, we have been to every hospital, and where we have not found it, we've told them they must do it. But do where, you know where, that they've where, all done it? Where we've found real problems, we've followed up with them. So we know that they've all done it? We, we know that they've all done it, and we'll go back and re inspect them due course. Okay, thank you. And um, come on now to ambulance services and Martin. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I noticed when you introduced yourself, nobody claimed responsibility for that's ambulance. Me, that's, right. <laughs> that's you, is it? Right, so, uh, um, very straightforward question. What are you doing to secure imp improvements in the ambulance service? Well, interestingly, uh, the ambulance, the, 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 what we've found in ambulance services across the country, and I'm talking about NHS Trust, mm. which are 10, uh, there's, there's variation there, just as there is in the other uh, NHS. We've got, we've got one outstanding ambulance service, we've got one that's inadequate and in special measures, and there's a variety in between. So, so we are seeing that variation in, in performance that we've seen in other parts of, of the NHS as well. And at the root of that is often exactly what we've found elsewhere, issues about leadership, issues about culture, uh, and issues about engaging frontline staff. And that may be more challenging in ambulance services because clearly they're dispersed. Uh, and they do, uh, uh, as many uh, NHS organisations do, they, they do have difficulty sometimes recruiting key staff, paramedics particularly, in ambulance services. So, so what we have done with them, to come, to come back to your question, is we have produced a detailed report on each one, we've rated each one, and we've held to account for improvement those that need to improve. And I should say individual ambulance trusts, and I'm thinking here particularly of London Ambulance, for instance, have made very, very significant improvements over the last few years as a result of our intervention. There are others who still need to make improvements, and there's a vari variation. If you look, say, at response times across the country, uh, the highest level of response times there, most ambulance trusts are fairly consistent in delivering. But if you look at the lower priority calls, there is quite a great degree of variation. And where we've inspected those trusts, we've told them where they needed to improve. Well, sadly, uh, what the trust that uh, serves my area is East Midlands, which, uh, as you'll be aware, is certainly not amongst the highest performing ones. And we, we also have Thames uh, providing our patient transport, which, uh, if anything, is, has an even poorer uh, record. Now, you're obviously aware that um, when uh, people read that their local ambulance service is in special measures or rated inadequate or whatever, that obviously causes some anxiety. And what, what do you actually do to follow through, can't you write the way through, I take note what you've, you've just said, but um, it's no good just sort of publishing one report and a year later say, saying they're still in special measures or still inadequate or whatever. Well, th th uh, and that is, uh, that's summarising the special measures regime. Uh, East, mm. East, East Midlands is, requires improvement and not in special measures, yeah, I should yeah. say. So, so, yeah. so, so uh, they do need to improve uh, mm. and we will be following them up to inspect them to make sure they do improve. So, so, so that, that's that. But, but the, the organisations in special measures, including ambulance trusts, uh, what the, the special measures regime is a regime that we recommend that is instituted by NHS improvement and they put in extra support to support the trust in making the improvements it needs to make. And the improvements are driven by what we found in our report. So essentially, when we recommend special measures, then the, uh, the uh, NHS improvement uh, uh, intervenes, uh, provides extra support, some extra resources, uh, and uh, uh, we will monitor that uh, as necessary, and we'll go back and inspect. And if, if, uh, if we've found inadequate services, we'll go back and sp inspect usually within a few months. Uh, if there are special measures overall, we'll re-inspect within a year. And by that time, and hopefully in a year, they will have turned themselves around. In practice, most special measures trusts take longer than a year before we can recommend they come out of special measures. I mean, my, lo my local newspaper um, over the last year or so has published an numerous stories where ambulances have failed to turn up to even even to road traffic accidents and um, you know clearly that's totally un unacceptable um, what uh, sort of um, how do the, uh, incidents like that feed into your uh, inspection well when we do an inspection we will review all their serious incidents mm. and, and we will make sure that they have investigated them have taken steps to improve 
ambulance services are under pressure, just like the rest of the acute services. And last winter, we saw a lot of ambulances that were held up at ambulance, uh, held up at hospitals, mm. uh, unable, no, to, 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 unable to hand their patients over. Yeah. Uh, and I made very clear to the hospitals that it is unacceptable for them to leave patients in ambulances on the forecourt, mm. uh, rather than admit them to the hospital. It may be the hospital is crowded, but actually the patient is going to be better off in hospital in an ambulance. And of course, that ambulance is needed elsewhere. Mm. And I, and so I think. The pressures on ambulance trusts because of this have been quite severe over last winter and to some extent going into the summer. Uh, some of them have risen to that. They've, they've, uh, they've uh, improved the extra staff and, and bought extra ambulances. But ultimately, we come back to where we started, that if we don't reform, reform the system and, and, and uh, organise for fewer people to be admitted to hospital than necessary, the constant pressures there will always exceed capacity for the ambulance trust or the hospital to cope with. Derek, did you want to follow on from that one? Um, and, and Sorry, so there's another specific uh, example, but there were um, concerns of bullying in the West Country Ambulance Service, which I think you looked into. Could you assure me or reassure me that if those problems did exist, they've now been satisfactorily addressed and you're happy well, with the, we, we've with the inspected, We've inspected and reported on the uh, ambulance service, and so we would have looked at that, yes. Uh, uh, in terms of the specific issue, can I take this way and come back to you rather than just answer off the cuff, but having said that, I think it's very important bullying in, in, in the healthcare system is still a worry for us, mm. it occurs in all organisations and it's a worry not just because it affects staff but because it affects the safety and well-being of patients and we are very clear that if we identify significant bullying in trust that, that reflects it, uh, very strongly in our reports on their leadership. You're right to me with, a, with, a, with a, where we got to on that, will you? I will write you that, yeah. Of the CQC um, inspection of South West Ambulance Services Foundation Trust. I mean, one of the, the issues that's raised time and again is the, the variation in the service people re receive depending on where they live. So, particularly the issue of rural areas, uh, because sometimes perhaps it can be distorted by a, a good service being provided in, in the towns because that's where the ambulances are tied up. But in the rural services, people ex are facing exceptionally long waits. Is that something that you're going to look at, the sort of well, challenge for? Rural services. Well, we have we have challenged Southwest Ambulance to improve their response times in our latest inspection. When at the latest inspection, they had made significant improvements in several areas, but response times were still a concern, and we've told them they need to improve them further. Yes. Uh, we haven't got any data as such that um, what you say makes entire sense in terms of the geography. We haven't got any data as such that uh, tells us that rural services get less. Uh, prompt treatment, but it, it clearly there are good reasons why that might occur. We've certainly heard in some ambulance trusts that by positioning ambulances, you know, in the right geographical places, predicting where the demand is going to be, they can speed up their response times. Mm. And we'll Indeed, certainly, look, we'll certainly, if we see good examples of that, we will certainly use those examples to demonstrate to the sector how they can improve. Yes, I think that the, you, you identified the issue, though, in your earlier answer, is that they then get sucked in from yeah, those yeah. because they're delayed in, yeah. in handovers. Yeah, um, but, but it is a concern, so Derek wants to come on this as well. I've come across a few examples over years now, not just recently, where uh, the time that was reported that they arrived is actually different to the experience on the ground. Uh, do your inspections look at the quality or the accuracy of recording? Because obviously if they're trying to meet a certain target, there is unfortunately the opportunity to maybe record something that's different to actually what happened on the ground. Can, you, can your inspectors get that into that much detail? Yes, we do get into that much detail. I mean, one of the great strengths of our inspections is we talk to frontline staff and ask them, how is it? And we talk to patients as right. well, of course. We don't just take the organisation view of the world. And the frontline staff are usually very honest with us if they feel they're being asked to present data in a way that's not accurate and doesn't reflect the patient's experience. And we, across the whole of, of the areas we inspect, we find that. We expect to see it in A&Es, we expect to see it in waiting lists, we expect to see it in numbers and turnarounds. And when we see it, we challenge it. But this comes back to this issue of leader culture and that leadership culture and values. Yeah. If, we, if, we, if we create an NHS in which people are so target focused that the tar meeting the target overrides everything, then eventually people start behaving in that way. Sure. And that's clearly unacceptable. It's, it's completely losing sight of why they are there in the first place. 
where we see it, we always challenge it. Yeah, no, that is good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Both. Thank you. And we're going to to Lucian. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be moving on to um, questions about mental health now. Um, but if I can also um, straddle the previous theme on, on ambulances. Um, you will be aware that in the budget yesterday, um, the Chancellor announced um, that he'd be funding ambulances specifically for those in a mental health crisis. Uh, and I wondered how confident you are um, in your ability to assess the safety of those particular services um, alongside your current responsibilities for ambulance services. Okay, uh, the, uh, in term, I, I very much welcome the focus on crisis care for patients with mental health needs. I mean, that is an area we've identified as a problem. Uh, we don't look at the commissioning of services, as you've heard, but we've heard from patients and we have observed real problems in crisis services. There is a big surge in patients with mental health crises arriving in accidents and emergency departments, which is clearly, in many cases, not the right place for them to be. And so creating an environment, be it in an ambulance or in the hospital or in a community mental health crisis centre where they can be looked after better is clearly a priority. So we very much welcome that. In terms of ambulances, there's a lot of innovative work going on around looking after patients with mental health needs by ambulance trusts. And coming back to London Ambulance again as an example, I know they are doing work where they don't take patients with mental health needs directly to A&E, they take them to community third sector centres or to uh, community mental health crisis centres. And I think that's exactly the right way forward. So there's good practice out there and I think if this money that's coming in is to be well spent for the benefit of patients, then people need to learn from the best. And we will try and ensure they do. Thank you. I, mean, I, th I think one of the questions that we need clarity on, I don't think any of us have, is that I mean, it's not clear that these ambulances will necessarily be um, provided by existing ambulance trusts and then there'll be a role for you specifically well, to... Well, well, obviously, as and when the ambulance services are set up, we will register them and, and inspect Indeed. them. Yeah. Um, it's very striking going through the, kind of the summary report that um, we have of your state of care report that um, there's some particular things that, that stand out about mental health in particular. Um, one in five NHS mental health core services need to improve. This is one of the headline um, things in here. Um, particular challenges around workforce uh, in the mental health sector. Um, low staffing levels are the most common reason for delayed access to children and young people's mental health services. Um, in particular, your report tells us that the number of patients are waiting to start mental health treatment in hospital um, 18 weeks after being referred rose by 55% from 2011 to 2018. Um, we know from your report that some people who need inpatient mental health care and support having to travel extremely long distances to mm. obtain it, and this varies considerably depending on where people live and that this also impacts negatively on recovery and the ability of patients to keep themselves safe. I wonder if you can indicate, Professor Baker, um, what re resources you believe are necessary to ensure that each one of these patients is seen in a timely and safe fashion. Well, uh, mental health services are, are doing a lot to improve and on our inspections you'll see in the report that actually their ratings are going up and often the message is that if you get into a service you get very good care. The problem that we hear from patients time and time again is the problem is with access, that people cannot access the service they want. And you're talking, you're talking there about out-of-area placements, uh, and certainly we saw pa patients sometimes being uh, placed 600 miles away from home, which I mean, clearly is not appropriate for, for patients uh, uh, with mental health needs in inpatient services. So we have argued, and we've, we've, we've uh, 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 been discussing this with NHS England, that commissions of services, that they need to focus more on commissioning services nearer to people's homes. And I think that's going to be very important in turning, turning things around. But there is still a capacity and access problem uh, you mentioned uh, children and young people's mental health and the, the report we published in, I think, January of this year, are, are, you, are You Listening?, is a very strong message from the young people themselves about the difficulty they face accessing mental health services. And I think there's, one, there's one story in there from uh, a, a, a young girl where she's saying, do I have to threaten suicide before I can get any care? You know, and, and, and that is the kind of crisis that, that some patients with mental health problems have to go through before the system provides care for them. So I think we need to look at the capacity and the resources, but equally we need to look at the way the services are organised. Because again there's a sense that the services are organised as individual services 
rather than as an integrated pathway of care for patients to make sure that every patient gets the care they need at the right level. So it isn't just resources, it's also how we organise and the system in which the mental health services work. But new resources, of course, are very welcome. I mean, on that theme, you said earlier that you welcome the investment in crisis service, and I think that would, uh, you know, we'd, we'd all share that, yeah. um, that welcome. Um, however, um, it was very striking yesterday in the budget that all the investment that's going to mental health seems to be at the very end when someone's in a crisis, rather than what we might do much earlier on in terms of earlier intervention or even, in fact, prevention. Is that something you'd, you know, is that a concern you'd share? Uh, well, I welcome the investment that's going into the services at the moment. That doesn't mean there aren't other services that need investment. Children and young people's mental health is an example of that, where there have been capacity problems for, for many years. I mean, that is not a recent thing. Right. Um, Many of the people on acute mental health wards uh, for adults of working age are detained uh, under the Mental Health Act, and we've seen from the figures that that number's um, progressively increased over recent years, and you'll know that there's a piece of work going on mm. looking specifically at the Mental Health Act um, by Professor Simon Wesley. Um, do you believe that you, as a CQC, have sufficient powers to protect the rights and the well-being of people who are currently held under the Act? Well, we, we uh, have extensive, uh, uh, we, we extensively inspect uh, inpatient mental health units to, 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 to ensure that the Mental Health Act is implemented effectively and the code of practice is being followed and we produce a report on that every year. We have been discussing very closely with Sir Simon Wesley in his report about where we think the direction of travel needs to be and we're looking very much, we're looking forward very much to his conclusions which I hope are coming out fairly soon. So to some extent we've been working with him on that to, to strengthen our role but also if you like to, to clarify our role related to the Mental Health Act. But a lot will depend on what his conclusions are about the future of the Mental Health Act itself. But from, from what you just said, the, the, the fact that you want to strengthen your role um, it would suggest that you don't currently feel that you do have sufficient powers to protect those rights. I, I think if you look at our reports on a year-by-year -year basis, you'll see that in all of them there are concerns that the Mental Health Act Code of Practice is not always being followed as it should. If that, uh, if the, that concludes, if that, if that answers well, the uh, why, As an extension to what you've just said, does that therefore mean that you have the power as an organisation to then ensure that you're doing the very best by patients who are detained under the Mental Health Act? I, I, I think I'd wait... I, I, I think I'd wait for Sir Simon Wesley's report to, to actually me, that, that's conclude not, that, that. That's not an answer. Sorry, that's not an answer. My question is to you. Do you currently believe that you as a CQC have the adequate powers to look after what are thousands of people across our country who are detained, whose rights are taken away from them, who are detained under the Mental Health Act? We have powers to report on, what, uh, on, their, uh, on their attention and, and, the, uh, and how the code of practice is being implemented. We have powers through second uh, 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 appointed uh, 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 doctors to to provide alternative uh, uh, opinions. Uh, so, and, and in 28% of cases, uh, our opinions uh, change the care of the patient. So we already have quite considerable powers. Whether they are sufficient, I would wait to see whether uh, uh, Sir Simon Wesley suggests anything different. Uh, forgive me, I mean, you should be able to, you know, as a person in charge of mental health, you should be able to tell us whether you think you have the powers necessary to uh, do everything that you possibly can to protect the rights of those people that are currently detained. I don't think that's an answer. But well, I, that, I think that's as far as I can go at the moment. Okay. What happened to strong independence? If you don't, either you think it or you don't. Uh, uh, there's an expert review going on into the... the but yeah, the but you are being asked what you think. The Mental Health Act, and to some extent we are interested in the outcome of that, of that uh, expert review rather than to tell it what, what... We're working very closely with it, but we don't want to tell it what it should, which should say. I think we want to hear its experts. But you can have your own position and view as a people currently, as a person currently responsible over, with overall responsibility in this country for uh, mental health for the CQC. You can have a, a, a position whether you think that you have adequate powers to uh, essentially um, protect the rights and well-being of those thousands of people that are detained in this country. I think it is widely that. believed that it needs to be reviewed, and our powers in, in the wider context need to be reviewed. And I totally accept that. But I would like to see the expert opinion 
opinion of the people who are looking at this before I come to a conclusion. You are an expert because you are currently the person in the high, you know, in charge. I guess maybe the question would be what advice you have given to the panel when they ask you about whether your powers are adequate. I can, I can, I can give you a, a written account of that rather than off the cuff here, if, if I that, may. That, that would that be may helpful. helpful. If you could Thank send you. us to what you're advising the Mental Health Act review to, to say about your own powers, that would be useful for us. Um, can I come on now to primary care, if, if I could, Professor Steve Field, um, ask you about your main concerns about the sector that you're regulating? I know you've touched on some of that already, uh, but could you perhaps go a bit narrowed down to primary care rather than the whole system sure. aspect um, of it? And it depends, well, as you well know, as a GP, the primary care is very broad. So. Would you like to talk about online consulting? It's an area specifically I wanted to ask you about, <laughs> um, because obviously it's a it's a, a rapidly emerging area, yep. and um, and the new Secretary of State is obviously uh, going to be uh, focusing on this. And and there's various aspects of that. It's not just the use of health apps, which yep. nobody seems to regulate. Um, no. It seems to be that it's just trading standards that NICE don't have any role and, and nor do the CQC, it seems. I mean, yeah. so it's, it's looking about both the role of apps that patients are relying on, yeah. but also uh, systems like Babylon um, and uh, GP at hand. So the, the, obviously the MHRA have a, a, a role as, as well, but our specific role, as you heard earlier on, is about uh, consulting doctors and nurses online, either by video, over the phone, or by um, paper mm -hmm. system, email systems, um, for patients in England. Uh, what we don't do uh, are, is exactly the same as, as that, but if they were pharmacists, that's the general pharmaceutical regulator. Um, and so there is a division. So if it involves a doctor and a nurse, we are responsible. And we started our work in 2016 um, uh, and brought the speed of the work forward because we heard, were hearing lots of concerns and uh, we completed our work in July 17. Of the 35 um, organisations, uh, providers that we looked at, um, uh, only five of them were, were actually um, fully safe in everything they were doing at the time when we first went in. And um, we have seen a, an improvement in their provision of care because we go back and inspect uh, soon afterwards. And uh, partly due to the impact of that report, uh, uh, there has been change and we will be able to rate those services from April onwards. So on one hand, I would say I think uh, I would support the introduction of these alternative ways of consulting. Uh, because it could save time for clinicians and certainly will save time for patients that want to use those services. But they do have to be uh, safe and effective, just like uh, traditional face-to-face -face consulting. And so one of my concerns is to make sure that as these services are rolled out to more patients across the country, that they are uh, receiving safe, effective care. The evidence is, it, is they are improving. Concerns that they may have a destabilising effect on the wider system. Um, and in other words, are you looking not just at that individual alternative model, yeah. but the effect it could have on those models around it, particularly in, say, semi-rural and rural areas? No, I understand what you're saying. Um, the, the problem we have as CQC is we're, we are... Uh, an independent and strong regulator, but we uh, do not do the commissioning, have no responsibility for the commissioning and the contracting. Mm -hmm. So we are observers of services um, that perhaps have started recently in London, uh, if you're alluding to the impact on other patients there. So we can observe that and we will actually be looking at the surgeries that might be impacted on the quality of care they provide. But what I must say is, under the radar, there are surgeries that are providing exactly the same care for their patients and providing brilliant service. So if you go to a Marple Cottage Surgery in Stockport in Manchester, you'll see a surgery that's outstanding that uses Skype. It uses exactly the same uh, sort of um, systems as, as others. And it reduces the number of um, home visits and, and things. So 
Uh, and we know that one of the very big new providers of general practice um, modality, which covers 400,000 patients, have recently signed a contract with one of the other online providers to roll that out across their services uh, for those that are already on their list using their records. So there's a high-profile case at the moment which, which might uh, be um, having an effect on patients in their locality, but there are other things happening at the same time. And that really is a question I think you should ask uh, with respect NHS England as the overarching body. You mentioned about some of the safety concerns and you said that only five of the 35 that you inspected originally were fully safe. What were the safety concerns that you identified that need so, to be yeah, addressed? So yes, I mean thir thir 30 had problems and yes. um, of the first five or six we saw, um, a, a couple of them went out and stopped uh, stop work very quickly because we'd gone in. So mm. I think uh, the answer to, 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 to Rosie's question, are we strong, we have, uh, we are, and we had a big impact, I think, particularly in this sector. Um, you know, we will not tolerate um, the, the provi providers who provide very unsafe services. So what was it that was very unsafe that so, you were so observing? What was there the were a number, of, to give a number of examples, one would be... Um, uh, the prescribing of large amounts of opiates, um, uh, some phenomenal amounts of opiates in some cases. Um, we uh, found examples where uh, providers weren't checking the identity of the patient that was consulting with them and we were worried that children might get access to medications um, if they were masquerading, if you like, as an adult and they weren't adequately checked. Mm -hmm. Of course, as a GP, you'll, you'll recognise that you, when you see a patient in surgery, you've got the list and you know who they are. It's very difficult if it's a service provided in one part of the country remotely for somewhere else. Um, information uh, uh, sharing uh, is an interesting one because the GMC have this in their code of practice. But patients should be uh, really um, asked and should be encouraged to share the information uh, from that consultation with their own GP. Of course, there are particular circumstances you'll be aware of in sexual health where that isn't the norm, but generally that's good practice. And if you're prescribing medications like uh, thyroxine or, or, or other drugs, uh, asthma inhalers, you should be followed up by um, the uh, provider. Uh, you should have the relevant blood tests. Uh, you shouldn't be able to access large numbers of inhalers or large numbers of opiates without appropriate checks. Now, having said that, we found some very, very good practice as well. And one of our concerns was safeguarding. But we found one provider that was doing a really, really good piece of work. Mm -hmm. We know that those providers can provide safe, effective care because many do, and even more do now we've, we've intervened. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm an optimist about this. I think it does add to um, the... Uh, it'll improve access and add to the variety of care that the patients can, can get, but it's about access to the medical record, it's about communication, it's making sure things are safe, mm -hmm. and that's what's been exercising our mind. The other issue is, of course, as you highlighted earlier on very well, is the regulation problems, um, that uh, if um, one of these providers moves outside England, we don't have a regulatory responsibility. Mm -hmm. If... Uh, the service closes uh, from a doctor consulting point of view and becomes a pharmacy consulting service. It's a different regulator that looks after that who exercise their powers differently uh, to us and they're under, uh, just finished I think, consultation about how they should do that. So what I've done is put together all of the regulators across the UK. Uh, we converse uh, very closely as part of that with the MHA uh, I say the GMC and MC, and uh, try to look at what we can about having standards across the UK. Mm -hmm. But I am very worried about those who move offshore into yes, Europe and that's, elsewhere. That is very worrying. And can I ask where you see, um, for example, phenomenal amounts of opiates being inappropriately prescribed? I mean, do you then directly take that up with the GMC and report concerns? Uh, well, we've got enforcement action that we can do ourselves. You've got an and, enforcement action, but do you also and take we action report to, to the GMC. you do report to the GMC? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I Thank have a you. duty as a doctor as well as... Yes, I just wanted as, to... As I assumed that GM. was the case, but I just wanted to... Oh, of course. Check the, that this, that is, this is 
serious stuff about patient safety. Yeah, of yes. course we would, yeah. And then just a final question for me. What, what do you see being the key challenges for your successor? What are you going to be suggesting that they focus on? Well, I think it's a wonderful job. Mm. Uh, seriously, I think it's a wonderful job. The heavy lifting, if you like, about what I've been doing as Chief Inspector, about bringing in a regulation system for general medical practice, uh, we've got a system for dentistry, for, you know, we've created things against some considerable opposition at times. Um, so I think the successor actually will be in, in a very good place for taking forward the local system review work if that expands because the job description uh, includes a lot of work about integrated care. And so the, the challenge in general medical practice, for example, will be how do we regulate larger providers, uh, with, which are, are similar to large dental providers or large care home providers, and how do you look at the controlling mind and work in a different way to having 8,000 small practices. So I think that's going to be quite challenging, but the challenge is a great one for whoever takes over because of the system work. Thank you. I'm going to come on now to social care. And uh, Derek. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for being so uh, patient. <laughs> um, so you heard briefly my concern about the risk to care homes when there's any sort of period challenge or judgment against them. Um, but obviously you have to balance that, as, you, as we heard, about the safety of people that are in care homes. And there has been high-profile occasions where uh, various investigators have picked up some horrendous practice. How do you um, balance the availability of the right kind of care with the work you do and making sure it's all safe so that actually you don't end up putting more pressure on a system where we've already got a declining number of care home beds available to the community anyway. So thank you very much for that. And I'll answer it in two ways, one specifically around the care homes and secondly around what the system as a whole needs to do, sure. building yeah. on the work that we did in the local systems review. So specifically around the care homes, I think that um, everybody here would not want us to compromise on quality and on safety for people who are using care services. And I'm certainly not going to and I'm certainly not going to expect my staff to. So we're very clear about our expectations. If those expectations are not met, we are very clear about what people need to do to improve um, the service. And if they don't improve the service and they are putting people at risk and exposing them to severe harm, you know, for example, completely inappropriately um, uh, looking after people who are at risk of choking, um, feeding them with food which would cause them to choke and that will cause a problem. Um, we will not tolerate that and if we have to, and as you heard earlier from my chairman, it's not an action that we want to take lightly. We would much prefer that services improved but if we have to close a service because we do have that high level of risk then we have to do it and I don't think that we should compromise on that because if we do compromise on it we're kind of saying that's okay you know it's okay to allow um, poor services to exist we should be um, being very clear about the standards so that's the first thing um, the second thing is what do we do to prevent it um, what can we do to make sure that we're not in that situation and CQC is a very important role, but so, is, but so have others. So our important role is to be clear about those standards, monitor, inspect, um, rate the services, and share that information um, with the provider, but also with the public. So everybody's very clear about what it is that we're expecting and what we're seeing. What we also need to have is for the provider to respond to that and for the provider to take what we say seriously. And we produced a document earlier this year called Driving Improvement, which looked at services that had progressed from being inadequate and through to good. And one of the key aspects of that was they took what we said seriously. They responded to it. So that's absolutely what we need to see. We also need to see commissioners sharing our view of quality and ensuring that when we've identified concerns, they don't put more pressure on the individual service by forcing them to take additional um, people to support, because all that that does is just spread the problem wider and impact on more people. But we also need, as my 
dear colleague has already said, um, to see the health service step up to the plate. The NHS does not stop at the care home door. And sadly, sometimes it feels as if it does. And we need to make sure that GPs are providing appropriate support, that community services are providing appropriate support, and that um, the acute hospital is working in tandem with those services, particularly if people are admitted and then discharged back. I hear awful stories of people being discharged from hospitals where medication has changed and they don't tell the care home. So you know, that, that, is, that is not acceptable in terms of the pressure it then puts on. So it's a whole system response to it that helps us to prevent um, the problems um, uh, worsening. My concern about adult social care in, in general is our infrastructure to support improvement is actually quite thin. Um, there's, not, there's not as much there. You've had conversations earlier today about our work with NHS improvement. We don't have the same level of resources in adult social care. And recently we've been producing uh, publications called Learning from Safety Incidents. We've done six of them and they're looking at where we have prosecuted providers or taken um, significant enforcement action, what was the problem, what did we do about it, what could people do to stop that happening in the future. Um, things don't fly off the shelves in the digital world, but it's, it's like that. The number of downloads that we've had of people looking at it, wanting to know what they can do to do it better, I think that's another way that we can help as well. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you've, I don't know, I doubt that you've had time to reflect as you come to the end of your tenure, but what kind of, um, is there more to what you've just said in terms of what's really niggled you or what you've really felt is a problem within the sector other than the infrastructure which you've described, but also about your ability as a CQC to really um, get on top of the challenge and do the job well. I mean, is there a particular thing that you just don't feel content that we've probably resolved or have made enough progress on? So I guess the way that I would like to answer that question is to think about what do I think the pressures are on adult mm. social care and therefore how can we respond to them? So the first one is that uh, quality is variable and we can see that in the State of Care report uh, but particularly what we're seeing now and is a concern is that uh, when we've said that a service is inadequate, they do generally improve. The figure that we've got in state of care is 89%. But actually, 42% um, of services that we say require improvement don't improve. And we're going back to services now that we have rated as good and they're deteriorating. So 20% are deteriorating to requires improvement, 3% to inadequate. And, I, and what's troubling me is why is that happening? Um, and I think at the root of it is a concern about the workforce. You, these are difficult jobs that we're expecting people to do. They're not low-skilled jobs, they're highly skilled jobs. They're supporting people with complex, difficult needs. We don't pay them enough, uh, we don't recognise them enough, um, we don't esteem them enough, um, and as a consequence, we've got a problem with recruitment and retention. And that is at the root, I think, of a lot of the problems that we see in individual services, particularly around safety, so the need to have enough people sufficiently capable and competent of supporting. The second area is around leadership and again we know how important the registered manager is in a care home or in a domiciliary care service, absolutely vital and there are high levels of vacancies, high levels of turnover in those posts and that has a direct impact on people's experience of care. So I think we've got to do a lot more to support and enhance the leadership capacity in adult social care to take things forward. And I think that we've also we've got a problem with access. We know that there's a problem with access um, uh, in terms of what Age UK have said around 1.4 million people are not getting the care that they might have done previously, and that is obviously impacting um, uh, on everybody uh, uh, in terms of at the stage that they do eventually access services, they've probably got a higher level of needs. They're 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 they're, they're iller, sicker, uh, um, and more frail. 
And last but not least, we are seeing um, providers struggle in a very economically challenged environment. Um, so we are seeing providers handing contracts back to local authorities because they can't uh, sustain it. And we're also seeing services going out of business. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's not because we said that they should mm -hmm. go. Um, it's actually because they, they do not feel that they can sustain um, uh, the service that they're wanting to provide. So I think the sector as a whole is very fragile and we said two years ago that we thought it was approaching a tipping point. Mm. For some people it has already tipped mm. because either they're not getting the care that they might have done previously or they've had a change in the care, or they've suffered a discontinuity of care because somebody's gone out of business or handed a contract back or they're experiencing poor care because of that variability. And, you know, I don't think we're the only people to change all of that, mm -hmm. but we are part of it, and so that certainly does leave me with work to be done for my successor. Um, so just really one final thing, which is probably maybe any of the panel want to tackle this one. Given that you've so clearly set out what the challenges are and where we're kind of creaking and, and where we've seen that issue, which certainly is the case in Truro, uh, Cornwall, about yes. people not getting the care that they need because of the sheer availability of it, have you... Are you involved in the development of the 10-year NHS plan and are you able to contribute um, to how that is shaped and moulded and developed? Uh, and if you want to tackle that, Andrew, then maybe the others might want to contribute. Yeah. So I, I say two things. One is it's a 10-year NHS plan, not a 10-year NHS and social care plan, which I'd personally prefer to see, um, <laughs> given that uh, it's actually a whole system. And we have... Um, obviously got the um, green paper uh, uh, coming yeah, sure. uh, around yeah. social care and I do think that there is something and it comes out of the local system reviews we need to have um, an integrated vision so that we can truly deliver person-centered coordinated care and that has to come out of the NHS plan it also has to come out of the um, social care green paper and that's not just for older people mm -hmm. it's for all ages mm -hmm. and social care can transform people's lives in all sorts of different ways. It's not just there to help mm. the health service survive. Um, it is actually there to support people mm. and ensure um, uh, that they are able to live their lives as well as they can. So we are, uh, Ted co-chairs the um, uh, National Quality Board. We recently had a conversation at the National Quality Board about the NHS plan. So I was able to mm. contribute and there are other conversations that are going on. But my key thing would be, don't just think about the NHS, don't just think about what's happening in hospitals, think about what's happening in the community, think about what's happening for people, um, because patients are people before they're, they're patients, think about what people need so that actually the whole system can proceed. Is there and do you want to add to, to no, I thought that was a really good answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, seriously, I, I, yeah. I'd support that. I, I don't think I could do any better. We're, we're involved in different ways, inputting information, and uh, we have lots of meetings, uh, Quality Board and others. I chair uh, a governance board for general medical practice. We have one for dentistry where we meet with NHS England. Because similar to what Andrew said earlier on, in, in primary care, we also don't have the support of NHS improvement for improvement. Right, yeah. It's very different. So, uh, you, you know, other people, including the Royal College of GPs, have been involved in helping turn around general practice. But my message would be, we're doing this, this work on systems, whether it's people aged over 65 or children transiting into adolescence and adult or mental health or prisons. You've got to look at the people that we are all serving and what their needs are and build from that rather than just saying this is a hospital in Truro or a mm. GP surgery in St Ives or a care home in Penzance. Mm. It's how everybody works together for the good of those people. Mm. Uh, could, could, could I come, come in? I agree with everything that, that my colleagues have said. I, I've seen a lot of plans of, for change in the NHS uh, and they often change a lot of the structures and the names and the acronyms. but. Plans that matter change the care of patients and people using mm. services. And I think whatever comes out of this 10 year plan, I'm sure it'll be a great vision. Um, 10 years, a lot can change in healthcare uh, and will change in healthcare. But 
what's important is the implementation, the, what effect it has on the ground. Mm -hmm. And if the plan is not credibly going to change things on the ground, then it will not do what we need it to do. And we've talked a bit about leadership, culture, staff engagement. That's all very important. But the focus has got to be on the experience of patients and people using services, not on the kind of corporate structures. Uh, and I think that's really very important. Yeah. And the, the other thing is, as I said earlier on, the system is under a lot of pressure. The plan needs to deliver some real system improvements quickly. I mean, 10 years is a long time for the system to remain under pressure. We need the next 10 months to change things. That was really my point in asking, because the CQC had this wonderful opportunity of really getting into the systems, all the individual bits, and understanding it. So if there's any organisation that's able to fashion change and hold change to account, it's got to be your organisation. Well, we can if we could continue our work on systems. Mm -hmm. yeah. sure. But without um, either the Secretary of State giving us a Section 48 letter and funding, yeah. as it stands, or a change in legislation stroke regulation, then we will be focusing mostly on provision. I think that for my successor is a real, really sad. Mm. In your own uh, county uh, of Cornwall, we did a review of the system yeah. mm -hmm. as one of the pilots before this local system review. And I hope you recognise the problems. Um, and the problems in Cornwall um, are not dissimilar to the problems in many of the other areas yeah. we've been to. You know, you need leaders who talk together and produce a vision together. You don't actually need mer merged budgets. It's about how they respect each other and use the budgets for the people that they serve. And you need local politicians to help and be constructive despite the election cycles, which we find in some areas being awfully difficult. So uh, for Cornwall, it's everybody working together for the needs of the people who live there. That's right. Well, thank you for that. Thanks, Jane. Um, Andrew Sutcliffe, you've set out very clearly how fragile the system is in social care and the, the importance of the workforce. How concerned are you about the impact um, where we're seeing an agenda for change increase, very welcome increase for pay for nurses in the NHS, but that's not applying to nurses working in social care. Uh, do you see that as having a further destabilising effect on the nursing workforce within social care? I think it certainly has the potential um, to be uh, to de destabilise further. And we can see that already when there are local recruitment drives in the local hospital. Mm -hmm. I know where they're getting those nurses from. They're going to be getting some of those nurses from the local nursing home um, because the terms and conditions are better. Uh, my colleague, Glenn Garrett, who is the um, pres current president of the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services, described the uh, pay increase um, in the agenda for change as eye-wateringly high, which is probably not the way that people in the NHS would describe it, um, but from an adult social care perspective, uh, he was um, very worried about the impact, and I think, I think he's right to be so. And uh, there, there are concerns that um, it's not just the pay either, it's the terms and conditions, and sometimes um, the, the, the learning development opportunities mm -hmm very many um, uh, uh, people who are working in adult social care it's a lonely tough job um, they don't have the kind of panoply of people that you've got around you um, in a large acute trust or even in a community or mental health service and so I think there's lots of things that we've got to think about in terms of attracting people um, into adult social care, um, rewarding them appropriately and ensuring that they've got the training and development and also absolutely getting rid of the myth that there's no career opportunities in adult social care. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing place to work. There are some incredible things that you can do and people have very fulfilling careers um, but too often we have that comparison which is compounded as you quite rightly say by some of the terms and conditions and pay but we have that comparison that suggests that working in adult social care is somehow second class mm -hmm. it's not it's not and also reflecting your point that the doesn't just stop at the hospital, the, the, the care, that interface. Yes. Um, uh, one of the areas we, we came across in our nursing workforce inquiry and is, is the, there's a real issues around the nursing workforce in district nursing. How are you seeing that impact in your inspections? So I think that there's, um, and the King's Fund and the Health Foundation, I think it was, did a very um, interesting study uh, over a year ago 
which demonstrated, and they were using um, uh, NHS figures that demonstrated the drop-off of um, mm -hmm. community nurses and district nurses. And I think that that is having an impact on the ability to support people to maintain their health and well-being in their um, uh, normal place of residence, which could be their own home or it could be a nursing home or a care home. And this we have seen again and again in the local system reviews as well. And uh, the data packs that um, uh, Steve was talking about earlier, you know, demonstrated that in some local areas, not only were we seeing pressures in adult social care, we were seeing pressures in the local community services, and that was increasing the pressure into the local hospitals because people weren't being able to be supported in the community. And so it's, you know, and it's not the way that I want my mum and dad to be cared for and supported. They absolutely want to stay at home. They, my father hates going into hospital. Um, if he could, um, if that could be prevented um, by having proper support in the home, then um, that would be a much better way of doing it. So I think we have to see the whole picture. And uh, it's something that I will take with me into my new role, um, is understanding that nurses work in many, many different settings, and they have an incredibly important role across all of those settings, and we have to cherish and nurture that. Thank you. And then a final question for me was the interface with the voluntary sector in very many parts of the country now, certainly in my constituency, there are wonderful um, voluntary groups working very closely in tandem um, with social care. Um, do you also have a remit for inspecting their work as well? Our remit only extends if there is a regulated activity that is being provided, and that's typically personal care. So if there is a voluntary sector organisation that is providing personal care, they will be registered with us and we will be inspecting them as well. But one of the things that we do do, because there's a whole host of other um, uh, organisations that are supporting people and working um, with adult social care providers, one of the things that we're doing is when we're looking um, at providers and we are asking them whether they are well led, um, we're also looking at what are their connections with the local community, how are they ensuring um, that, the, that those connections are developed for the benefit of the people who are using their services. And in some of the outstanding and very good services um, that we see, there are some amazing um, uh, relationships and partnerships that have been built up that both bring the community into um, the care service but also um, take the care service out into the community and there's some really positive benefits that people can get from that. But to take it to the wider system um, point of view as well, one of the very sad things that we have seen in the local system reviews is that we still typically see um, the coordination, integration between health and social care just extending to the statutory sectors, so the NHS and the local authority not extending to adult social care providers and not necessarily extending as far as it should do to the voluntary and, and community sector. And that has also been one of the recommendations that we've made, is that people need to um, recognise the significant contribution both the adult social care providers and the voluntary and community sector can make to the overarching wellbeing um, and health and support that people need in the community. Thank you. My colleagues have another point. Do either of you have another point that you'd like to raise? Um. No, I'm, I'm quite encouraged by the second panel, um, but you, you, you guys are, are not going to be around, so we have to forge new relationships. I suppose I really, really worry that um, how we, we talk about leadership in health services, leadership but leadership in social care, and we're not, yes, we're not paying uh, enough for everybody involved. And sometimes I, I, I mean, I share your view, um, so I, before I get this next comment, take my <laughs> context. Um, if it's not good enough for my dad, it's not good enough for anybody. But I wonder whether we go for it and penalise social care um, owners um, really hard and we we find it much more difficult to do it in, a, in a, an acute setting and, and, and others not we have to do it hard in both but I wonder whether um, we could 
do a, a question, I suppose, that was asked before. Can you tell us any acute or GP services that you've really gone in and sorted out? Not, not just a, a recommendation. I know there are some, because I know some. But there you go, I'm giving you an opportunity. And then uh, one point I would like to make yeah. after Steve has well, uh, I mean, said that. I, I think um, sorted out is an interesting <laughs> phrase. <laughs> Uh, uh, we, I think, <laughs> uh, we, we've been to court and closed surgeries. Uh, we've been to both NHS and private surgeries. We've been in court recently. We were very reluctant to do that because we'd rather them um, improve. It is very difficult in general medical practice in some areas because we don't have the same NHS in, improvement sort of support that would go into a hospital. But the Royal College of GPs. Uh, has been in and they published a report and practices have improved. Some will be merged out of uh, their current provision into bigger organisations, but we can provide you with um, lots of information about how we've acted <coughs> very robustly for patients. Uh, not only that, is we can restrict them taking on new patients uh, so that they don't expand and expand. There's, there's all sorts of things we can do. So, if I may, um, in a way, part of the answer hopefully helps um, to reassure you for the future as well, because one of the things that we're very clear about is that our enforcement policy within um, uh, the Care Quality Commission does need to be consistent across. We need to have consistent principles. One of my Deputy Chief in Inspectors, Debbie Westhead, who is actually the Chief, uh, Deputy Chief Inspector that covers the North, so covers your patch, um, is the corporate lead for CQC on enforcement. Um, Debbie absolutely has the bit between her teeth <laughs> um, for the entire uh, organisation in terms of being very clear about our standards. The decision tree that we have that takes people down the pathway um, uh, that, uh, uh, to reach decisions about enforcement is consistent across um, all three of our sectors. And we're also putting in place a, a variety of different um, support mechanisms, um, uh, regulatory skills training and, um, to uh, strengthen our enforcement approach. I think you're right. If you look at the um, spread of activity, uh, more of it happens in adult social care. But that's not to say that it doesn't happen in the other two areas. <laughs> and that's particularly so from the criminal enforcement point of view. We have taken prosecutions forward um, in, in the hospital sector as well as in the adult social care sector. So I think sometimes it's, it, there's, there's more volume in adult social care because our regulation is for 25,000 locations. So it's always going to be more numbers. But I think that you will see other, other uh, action taken elsewhere. I think that's pick up on it a, a, a lot more. I think that's what I was trying to reflect. But also, um, let, let me make a point on the record. For example, Liverpool Community Trust should have been in special measures, but you actually only put it into requires improvement. And I think that was because you took the system view that you didn't have the resources to man special measures, and if that had been another part of the organisation, your view would have been different. And that, if you like, jaundices me when I look at what you do. Just to reassure you, we are taking more enforcement action in hospitals, and we're still putting hospitals into special measures when necessary. Uh, so, so that is still going ahead. We can't close NHS trusts quite the way that, 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 that you carry. We have closed independent hospitals, though. But I, I think it's probably time to... Unfortunately, Sorry, thank you. we do have to uh, finish, but I'd just like to say thank you very much both to Andrew Suckley and Professor Steve Field for your work um, for the CQC. Thank you. Thank you.